Hi friend, Niklas here and welcome to today's episode. On the show today we have the musician, programmer, spatial interactive audio researcher Frederick Robinson. It was super cool talking to Frederick about his work in spatial audio which he uses to enrich uh, our interactions with robots and he also makes some super cool synthesizers slash musical interfaces Unity which I will leave a link to in the description below. You can check some clips he's done on Instagram. It, they're really really cool and he really inspired me to learn, starting to learn Unity, uh, to make some synthesizers myself. And if you're into this technology, programming, robots, music, I'm, I'm sure you will love this interview with Frederick and hopefully it can inspire you to start learning programming and Unity perhaps and, and WISE and, and stuff like that. So I really hope you're going to enjoy this conversation. And also, before we get into the interview with Frederick, please subscribe to the YouTube channel or Apple Podcast, Spotify, wherever you are listening or watching this show. Your support really helps and we're growing slowly but steadily. And that's all thanks to you. So I really appreciate your support. And also, if you want exclusive access to interviews before the public, please check out the Audio Tribe email list. There is a link to that in the description below as well. Just enter your name and email address and you have joined. It's completely free, of course, and super easy to do. Uh, but that's it. Let's get into the conversation with Frederick Robinson. So please enjoy. So, yeah, I, mean, I should say good morning to you. I mean, what is it, 7.30? Uh, it's 7.30, exactly. You still look fresh. I, I've i gotten used to it now. It's uh, it's a lot of work to stay up to date with the US and with Europe. Yeah. You got to get up a bit earlier. But, uh, I mean, it's fine. I'm the one who is on the other end of the world. We have our own little time zone bubble and everybody else is kind of somewhere else. So yeah, exactly. It. Yeah, it is a bit tricky. Um, but so, I mean, are you? Because I, I, I didn't really understand if you are you from Australia? No. No, no, no. I'm uh, originally from Germany, and ah. I I went to live a bunch of years in Switzerland, and now around two years ago, I came over here to Australia um, for ah. work. Um, but that's also not a long-term thing. So I expect to be back in either Europe or the States uh, in a, in another two years from now. Right. But how was it like moving to Australia? Is it, I mean, was it a shock or? <laughs> it's remote. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but, but it's a Sydney you live in, right? It's true. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah I do live in Sydney. And uh, it's very what's the, known what's the vibe for in Sydney. For its quality of life, yeah, yeah, people are mm. people are big fans. Um, yeah, I mean, it was a it was a mixed bag. I arrived here, and then we had these uh, once in a century uh, forest fires. Oh yeah, <laughs> and, and, and after a bit, the the pandemic started. Um, yeah. So there's still some stuff left to be checked out. Right. Um, yeah, that's the absolute but, uh, worst time to actually go to a country, I guess. <laughs> you know yeah yeah i get it's a bad time to be anywhere i suppose <laughs> but um i mean it's it's winter here right now and it's very mild and i can't right. complain that's nice i mean here i mean i'm in the uk it's it's been it's been pretty warm it's like 28 degrees the last few days mm. um i remember last year uh we lived in a small apartment in london and um similar sort of heat maybe like actually like in, in 30 32 so pretty hot yeah uh, and i was having an interview and my computer just didn't work <laughs> right so i had to we had to shut down the interview just reschedule it for a cooler day yeah uh, and i never seen that before happening uh it might be down to your shitty macbook i don't know but still it's really warm <laughs> you know yeah after a certain point everybody just gives up Exactly, exactly. Uh, but I got to say, because I was scrolling down your your um, Instagram feed, 
I think maybe it's your latest video. I'm, I'm not sure. But there's this instrument you made. Uh, I don't know what it's called, but on the title it said like musical interface experiment. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. And I saw it and I was like, what the hell is this? I mean, what is it? It looks it looks like you have a sound wave. And for people who who are watching this or listening, you should definitely check it out. I'm going to leave a link to it. It looks like you have a sound wave and then you're sort of like taking small bits of the sound wave out and making sort of synthesizer. Is that what's going on? Uh, yeah, so what it's called, it's called Debris, and mm -hmm. it's basically a Unity app. So Unity is a game engine, and it's so it's like a musical interface that's written uh, in a game engine. And what it lets you do it is lets you drag in a sound um, and shows you the waveform of the sound. And then that waveform is represented by um, just a bunch of individual fragments that together make up the shape of the waveform. Um, but you can interact with each individual frag fragment. So you can take out different bits, you can rearrange them, and then you have little kind of playhead objects that you can use to bring them close to specific fragments and then uh, play them back with a granulator engine. So that's the, the sound synthesis that's happening in the background. And that... I mean, yeah, it, it's exactly what you said. It's a it's a musical interface experiment uh, where I was kind of curious to to see what happens when you when you combine like a, a type of interaction, like dragging and dropping individual fragments of a of a waveform, very strictly with uh, a synthesis engine. Like you, there's a couple of few simple rules, and that's it. No parameters to tweak. No. Um, no kind of curve automation curves to do just really a very strict kind of interactive environment um mm. and that's that's kind of what came out of that and uh yeah that's so basically i have um uh, i did quite a lot of that in my in my undergrad there's a there's a kind of area of human computer interaction uh, research which is called uh, NIME research, so research into new interfaces for musical expression. Um, and that's basically a lot of that, like building new interfaces, being new, building new ways to control sound um, with gestures or with some sort of human input, um, and then building these instruments and then seeing what happens musically if something interesting sounding comes out of that. Right. And that's very much in that um situated in that area hmm. that's i mean all that stuff is super interesting i mean because i saw you also have like this gesture based performance system and yeah that that, goes... that's that's the one i'm referring yeah. to yeah right, right 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 but like using a game engine how does that work like what what, what language is that in is it c plus or uh how, how does how does that work uh, so Unity is, I, I mean, maybe to give a little bit of context, hmm. um, I was like maybe one and a half years ago, two years ago, um, I kind of started following all these visual artists on social media. Um, and one particularly interesting thing for me was people who would do daily sketching. And those were all like people who create visual art with code. And then they would do every day they would create a sketch that they would post and um, um, sometimes it would be successful and pretty nice and sometimes it wouldn't be so good. But the idea behind it was just like every day you try to create something with code um, and, and then share it and then just keep going. And this, this kind of way of working was very um, inspiring to me. Um, and I felt, hmm, well, it doesn't really make sense to make like a, a uh, 20 second piece of music every day and post that, is there some other way that I can kind of emulate this way of working? Is there some way where I can kind of work creatively with code um, in, in that kind of way? Um, and after a little bit of searching, I ended up with Unity and I thought, okay, so that's gonna be my pandemic project where I learn how to use Unity. Um, I kind of learn the necessary uh, software chops to to work with that creatively and then just see what comes out of it. I, I didn't know if I wanted to make something 
I mean, I knew I wanted to do some sort of interesting interactive audio stuff. So something that is primarily about sound. Mm. Um, and that's what I did. So I just um, sat through a whole bunch of Unity tutorials, which are all very high quality and very helpful. And it was a very fun, fun um, experience. And the language behind it is C sharp. So that's the right. that's the programming language that you use together with Unity. Um, but you can also do a lot without code. So if it's really like this, all the resources that you need. TV. <laughs> My dog is <laughs> having fun with his two toys. <laughs> yeah, that's um, uh, so there's the great thing about it is that there's a lot of learning resources, and if you want to learn how to do it, then the the resources are there. Yeah. So that's what I and then I started kind of trying to find ways to apply it, um, and that's that's where kind of debris is the first larger uh, interface experiment that came out of that learning process. Right, but so. Those tutorials, are those, on, are those on YouTube or uh, uh, anywhere else? Unity has a whole like tutorial environment. I mean, basically, they're very incentivized to teach anybody how to use it because that's right. part of their business model. And we, right. you can benefit greatly from that because it's just like well done teaching materials. It's not right. they don't rely on on people teaching it on YouTube, although that exists as well. But um, there's lots of high quality tutorials there. And I think during the pandemic, they're all free as well. So, mm. so that's so. on Unity's uh, own, own website, I guess, then? Or yeah. is it? Right. right. Yeah. <laughs> I'm definitely going to check that out because I'm, I myself also, because of the pandemic, got into to software engineering and coding. Right. Uh, yeah. And change because my. My day job was to like live sound. That's why that's why I did. Right. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. And then working with bands and whatnot. But also because of the pandemic, I changed my career to software developer. Mm, uh, yeah. But specifically iOS, and I'm looking for a way to to be able to do something like what you did, like work with music and audio, and somehow bring that to iOS. But my knowledge so far is that like Swift, the the language Swift. It's yeah. very limited when it comes to working with audio and whatnot, but you can bridge stuff, yeah. I guess. Yeah, um, I mean, it's it's all a bit... Uh, that's another thing I like about Unity, is you can just like mm. export it as any sort of app that you like. So once you have written something in Unity, you can export it as an iOS app, which is right. probably not the way you should do it, because it's probably not super... I mean, if you don't really understand what you're doing, like me, um, you'll run into resource issues and, and all that. Things are not going to be particularly clean, but for um, for this more kind of open-ended prototyping, exploratory work, that that felt like a really great shortcut. Because, yeah. um, I mean, what I'm doing right now is I've got... Uh, um, I'm integrating... Like interactive sound into a physical robot. And to do that, uh, I'm jumping here a little bit now. Uh, to do that, I basically need like an interactive sound engine on a mobile small computer that I can integrate into a, into a cordless uh, life-sized robot. Um, and I also do that with Unity. So I, I put write a Unity app that I can put on a little computer, a Latte Panda, which runs Windows, and then I can run that off a battery and put it in a robot. So like once you have kind of the basics down, there's lots of fun kind of creative exploratory ways to, to use it uh, mm -hmm. in ways that it's not particularly intended for. Right. But tell me more about that robot you're working on. I think I saw some of it on your website. Uh, but yeah, please uh, yeah, elaborate on, on that, that project. Um, yeah, so that's the reason I came here to Australia, basically. There was a, there was a call for a... I'm doing a PhD here right now. So, and the call for that was, it's a four year PhD project. Um, and what you do is you create, um, I think the, the official name was spatial sonic interaction design for human robot interaction. And what that entails is me designing sound for various robots, um, interactive sound, spatial sound, um, UX sound, all, all type, like whatever I can think of, 
um, mm -hmm. and then integrate that into into physical robots and then uh, put those robots in front of people and see how, what happens. And with the end goal being, um, what are the ways that you can kind of create novel, interesting, engaging, rich uh, communication experiences between robots and humans? Mm. And um, when I saw that, I mean, pretty much when I saw that title, Spatial Sonic Interaction Design for Human Robot Interaction, I was very uh, interested because it just sounded very peculiar. Um, and that's pretty much why I went for it, because I have a background in sound installation and this kind of needed a lot of similar skills. But it was in a from a completely different angle. It was it was not for site specific media installations, but it was for robots in people's homes or something like that. And that's uh, that's just a weird angle that I thought was really exciting. And that's what I've been working on for the last two years. And there's another two years uh, of that coming up right now. Right. And how, how's the whole project going? Is it? Are you? Are you? Um going to be able to complete it by the four years or still a lot to do? Uh, well, it's, it's, there's always a little bit of flexibility in these kinds of projects because I need to, well, I mean, in the end, I need to submit a couple of contributions to knowledge, but what those exactly look like is pretty much defined by me. They just need to be significant enough to be accepted, um, mm -hmm. but there's not a list of deliverables that I have to work through. Um, and obviously, I mean, there was a really nice robot in the works, which is currently in Japan and just stuck in manufacturing because of the pandemics and because there's no electronics there anymore. So everything got a little bit stuck there, uh, which means that I have to partially pivot into um, virtual robots um, right. built, for example, in Unity. And then instead of putting like a physical robot in front of people, I put maybe people in a virtual environment and then create sound design for a virtual robot and explore what happens there, which is, I mean, it's a, it's a bit of a compromise, but on the other hand, I'm really keen to work more with Unity and work more with, um, I mean, game audio as well. That's, uh, that's uh, an area that I never had much, um, actual experience in hmm. but a lot of the things that people do in game audio are really cool hmm. and fun so basically yeah. due to the pandemic i move a little bit away from physical sound installations and i move a little bit more into virtual environments and um and i'm still enjoying it very much there's a lot to learn and so that's that's always great for me yeah definitely but so if i understand it correctly like the, the the sound for robots um is it to make like robots instill more confidence in users or is, is that part of the work also to make that happen um yeah so there's a there's a lot that basically like whatever robots kind of send out as sound um, gets perceived by the people around it, and then they draw some sort of conclusions out of that. So, and and that happens in many different ways. From you make a robot sound like something they know from science fiction, and then they have certain expectations. Or you make a robot sound um, in some way that they're familiar with from product sound, and then they have certain expectations of that. Like there's a lot of uh, thinking that goes into the sound design of a car, for example, from like. How the sound, how the motor sounds inside the car, how the motor sounds outside of the car, how the closing of the door sounds. Uh, like, does that sound like it's really closed or not? Is it safe? And all these kind of things. There's a lot of kind of subtle communication that you send through sound, um, and that's all designed. And ideally, I mean, the the problem in robotics is that you put these really foreign, weird machines that at the moment can't really do a lot um, into people's environments. And you need to, I mean, on the one hand, like if it's done not, if it's done not well, then they can be quite um, awkward and uh, maybe even scary. 
And then on the other hand, if it's done really well and everything is really polished, the expectations are quite high. And then you kind of have something that sounds like it can do anything, but mm. it can't because, I mean, <laughs> like it's, it's still like a massive challenge to wash the dishes as a robot. So there's a, there's a lot of balancing kind of what you want to communicate and how you communicate it in order to create um, like um, an object that seamlessly integrates into a human environment without kind of sticking out. Right. Well, you know, that makes me think about like uh, AIs like Siri, uh, Amazon's, whatever it's called, uh, Alexa, I guess, right? And mm, Google, yeah. whatever. Because always like the the siri has always sounded the like most like a robot <laughs> and i don't know but like yeah. and also siri is also probably the worst performing of those of those three whatever you know i don't know how many there are but uh but i guess that goes along with what you're saying also like because it sounds so robotic and it's not really great and i guess like google's might be the the best one i'm not too sure but you know what i mean i think that it's also in ai right yeah mm. yeah I mean, that's specifically for um, uh, like text to speech engines. Um, mm. But there's a lot of, I mean, actually, I can, I can show you an example here. Yeah. <laughs> so there's this, I mean, generally, social robots had a hard time in the last couple of years. There were a couple of high profile Silicon Valley startups that, that tried to make it happen and all failed. And one of those is, is this thing here, which is called right. Cosmo. Um, which is, I don't know, this one is Vector. Um, and it's basically also, so it has some sort of functionality. There's an AI in there. It can recognize your face. It can uh, recognize your name. But it doesn't speak uh, English. But instead, like, the whole language is, is modeled after something like a, a small, intelligent alien slash pet. And so the entire language is is kind of focused towards that and you have little bleeps and bloops and then you have the sound of the motors and you have the uh, like some sort of reactions and it can purr and it can hiss um <laughs> and so there's like this whole language being built um to create like a believable small alien pet um right. <laughs> and all of that happens without any english so it's um and it's prime it's also not uh, functional it's primarily uh or entertainment um, and then if you have like a voice assistant that's primarily functional so there's not so much thought being put into uh, what series backstory where does she come from and stuff like that mm. uh, but it's more about like how can it get stuff done quickly mm -hmm. um, so there's a there's a broad range of, of application areas as well yeah but I mean how, how, how would you for example be able to improve or how how would you suggest to improve like those Siri and Alexa voices or with sounds? I mean, could you do that with sound uh, effects for lack of a better word? Um, yeah, so the thing about these voice assistants is that right now they're kind of coming out of a smart speaker, which is not, it's not really like a physical robot. So you don't need to think about, does it move? Um, and also when you talk to Siri, it's um, like, especially if you have like several smart speakers around the house, you don't really think of Siri as that's the voice of this particular smart speaker, but it's like a voice that's just present in the environment. And it connects me to the Google service, uh, to the services of Apple or the services of, of Amazon. Um, so if you if you think of a, of a robot that could actually move around the house and that has its own voice, but that can also connect to internet services, um, there's a bunch of additional new elements that come in. So mm -hmm. how does the robot sound when it moves around? How does the robot um, does the robot have its own voice or is it connected to an external service? Uh, when you have like, I don't know, like you have UX sounds that you know from apps, like do those arrive at the robot? Does the, how does the robot inform you that those kind of sounds arrive? Are those kind of sounds external to the robot or is that something that the robot tells you with its own voice? Um, there's also some thinking going into um, like can the robot connect to other loudspeakers in its environment? 
So like, can you hook up the robot to your smart speaker? And then what's the difference between the robot speaking out of its own speakers versus coming from the smart speaker or from the, from the sound bar, from the TV? So there's also this kind of element of orchestration around it, which is particularly interesting for me because I originally came from um, multi-channel sound installations. So this mm -hmm. idea like, where do you place sounds in the environments and uh, what effect does that have? Uh, that's a very interesting playground for me. Yeah, definitely. But so, if you can take us through, like, how 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 does it all work? <laughs> I have seen a question of how does it work, uh, but in terms of your work, like how? Because I guess you don't build the robots themselves, right? But you, no, or do you? Right, right. No, no. But how how are you able to? know if the robot where the robot is like I said as a robot in an environment how are uh, you yeah. able to determine I can yeah. tell you I can tell you about a project that I'm currently working on so there's this robot which is um it's called uh, let's call it DD and it's a it's like one and a half meters tall and it's um it moves on wheels it has like a, a mobile base that it can move on on wheels around and right now I'm as a case study, designing sound for that robot from beginning to end, like from the, the very early conceptual phase, what does it even sound like, all the way to the end, uh, to integrating speakers into it, um, and then turning that into, well, I mean, the format is, I guess, pretty much a sound installation. So like you, you integrate uh, sound into it, and then you make that interactive to the environment. Um, and so the very first step is to kind of make a, a, a strategy for how you want the robot to sound. And in this case, the robot has a, a kind of harder outer shell, which looks like a, a marble sculpture. So it looks like it's a, it's a marble Greek sculpture that, uh, that moves on wheels. So from that, I kind of say, okay, well, I want the, the basic sound material of this robot to be... Um, stone or marble um and then in the next step i say okay so i'm going to like build a, a sound set for this robot which is oriented towards marble so there's various instruments out there which um are built with rock like there's there's stone chimes um and there's actually rock horns so like rocks with what? with little cavities inside them that you can blow and play like a horn so, horn. so there's like wind instruments that are built using rocks um wow. and um there's there's other stones which are kind of like stone instruments which is like a, a block of stone and you have these little um cavities ground into it and then you make it wet wet and you rub it and it's like a um i don't even know what that sounds it creates like um inharmonic drones when you do that like you you make the stone resonate and that creates like these long uh, these long resonating inharmonic timbres. Um, so that's like a, a discovery phase where I put together the, the many ways that I think uh, rock or marble could sound. And then I put that together uh, as the source material. And then out of that, I create um, all the different sound assets that I think might be necessary for the robot to send out. So for example, I'll, I'll like, get some recordings of rock rubbing against each other and then process that with some rhythmical processing to create like a sound for when the robot moves. Um, and then I actually for this particular one, there was also, I also took inspiration from the last um, Zelda sound design, Zelda Breath of the Wild, because a lot of that is like you have these ancient stone magic um, constructive environments, like all the shrines and stuff. There's like, what are the metaphors here? It's old, it's ancient, there's some sort of technology, but it's really magic. Um, and that was kind of the, the metaphor that I had in mind. So I create like this kind of, I use these um, rock wind instruments with some processing to create kind of this, what would an old ancient marble piece of technology sound like? Oh. Um, and then I put all of that together and then I have kind of the sound design assets. Um, and then as a next step, I integrate them into 
uh, WISE, which you might be familiar with, so mm -hmm. the game audio middleware, mm -hmm. um, to create the interactive element. So then I, I put that material into that WISE session and then I hook it up to all the ways that um, that sound material will be affected. So for example, what's the speed of the robot? What's the battery level of the robot? What's the distance of the robot to a human? How many humans are currently around the robot? Um, how much time has passed since somebody last interacted with the robot? Um, or what is, is the robot turning or is it moving straight or has it not moved for a while? So those are all kind of external parameters that I need to use and hook up to those sound assets so that um, in the end you have a robot that kind of <clears throat> has like some idle chatter going on when nobody interacts with it. And then as you get closer to it, it kind of notices you. And then there's like a soundscape that is constantly running, like the, the hum of the engine, but it's not an engine, but it's like like a more freely, freely created um, magic ancient technology soundscape. <laughs> um, and then once the robot notices you, there's like a, an interaction action sound that kind of like is like a wake word, so the robot becomes active and then it moves towards you. And um, then there's like an internal uh, parameter that I call uh, stimulation. So if a lot of people are around the robot and communicate a lot with it, that takes the soundscape. So it's a bit of like game music techniques and um, game audio techniques together hooked up to all these uh, robot parameters. Right. And so that's the wise session. Um, and then as a next step, I write a little uh, Unity wrapper. So basically like a little Unity game that runs inside the computer and wise, the wise session is integrated into that. But instead of the Unity session taking inputs, uh, keyboard and mouse inputs or controller inputs, the inputs actually come from the robot. So the um, well, the robot has various ways to kind of see its environment. Um, there's a couple of onboard cameras, there's infrared sensors, and then it's connected to um, the testing environment of this robot, which is a, a space which is basically completely decked out with connects and creates like a point cloud of the entire environment. So like everything that's in that space is being tracked by connects and that gives you uh, position data of everyone in the room. And What's connects, uh, by the way? Uh, connect is um, the- Was it Connect? Uh, or is it connect. Con it's ah, the, connect, right. connect. Yeah, it's the cameras by uh, that were used together with the Xbox for a while. Ah, and that's, okay. that's specific to this um, sensor environment, like this experimental environment where I deploy the robot um, which gives you the possibility to kind of track everything that's happening in the room. Um, so that's kind of the sensor data that, that is available from the robot. And that goes then into the Unity session, gets uh, sent through to the WISE environment. Um, and then in a final step, now we have in the robot, we have a small computer, we, everything is battery powered, and we have a couple of amps and we have loudspeakers. Um, and for this particular robot, I have eight loudspeakers in the robot, right. um, which is um, two are kind of inside the robot that provide low frequencies. And then I have uh, two sets of small, smaller drivers, which are attached to the shoulder, basically two facing front, two facing to each side, and two facing to the back. And they're placed on the shoulder because that's the place where they can be hidden under some fabric. So this is about visual integration so you don't see the speakers. Um, so that's the system, the loudspeaker system that's being used. So then the last thing for me to do is hook up a connection from the small audio computer that plays back those sound assets out to eight channel audio um, until people can hear it. Wow. That's awesome. <laughs> That's so interesting. That was, that was the process. But, yeah. But so, but yeah, when you explain it, it sounds not easy at all. But it makes sense, you know, the the the, the process. Um, 
But so, because I've heard about Wise, but I never, I never used it. But essentially, is that is that also used for games? Like, it, to... I mean, that's what it's used for. I'm I'm right. using all these tools and in ways they're not really designed for. Uh, but yeah, Wise is a is a game audio middleware that lets you. Basically, it has an authoring environment where you do the sound design, and then it wraps that in a sound engine, which is integrated into a game engine. Right. And basically, what it the the main benefit of this is that you, as a sound designer without a strong software background, can specify all this behavior. So, like, um, gen usually you have something like if the player takes a footstep then you randomly choose from these 10 footstep sounds. Unless the player is in water, then you, ch you choose from these 10 footstep sounds, which are in water. Unless the player is running, then you choose these different footstep sounds. So you can create this very uh, deep and complex interactive sound, and you don't have to use any code to do it because you have this authoring environment. And then you just compile it, basically, and it gets right. turned into code, which is then integrated in the in the audio engine. So it's like a basically saves you a bunch of programming um, mm. and it lets you very quickly create very rich interactive um, soundscapes. Right. That's cool, man. I need, I need to get into and learn some of that. <laughs> Sounds very creative, inspiring. Uh, it is. I mean, I was so far. I mean, I've started using Wise maybe half a year ago. Mm. Um, it was also on my list of things that I really wanted to try out. Um, yeah. And until then, I had, if I needed interactive audio for one of my sound installations, I would just code that behavior myself using uh, Max MSP or Max for Live in Ableton. Um, and once I started using Wise, it's just so tuned to the requirements that you have as a game sound designer um, that the workflows are just really powerful. You just immediately know like whatever you can, whatever you need to create um, the largest amount of depth and richness with the smallest amount of, of resources and in very short time, all these workflows are very tuned towards that. Um, and that just makes it really fast and effective to do. Right. And can you use this with like iOS too? Do you know? Yes, you can. You can use nice. it with. Um, uh, I think they're compatible with most platforms out there, all the game consoles and even Linux. I tried for a while to integrate Wise into a Raspberry Pi, but I had to <laughs> had to give up because. I was I needed to write something in C++ and I just despaired so I and and then <laughs> I did use a Raspberry Pi but I used a Logic Panda which can run Windows so I can put Unity onto it and then that integration is taken care of for me. Right right right. But the possibility is there. Mm. Yeah yeah awesome. But so going back to that uh, gesture based performance system with the hand like you can do movements and it creates some awesome sounds like how the hell did you come up with that? And how the hell did you solve solve that problem, I guess, to be able to make it work? Because that's also super inspiring. Uh, thank you. I started, I mean, basically, like, I in my undergrad, I my degree was called audio design, which was, like, music technology. 50% music, I sang in the choir and I played the piano, and then 50% programming and wow. sound installation and some audio engineering. So like basically giving you a bunch of tools to to uh, to play around with and experiment. Very generalist, a very generalist skill set. And um, this idea that you put a sensor in your hand and then you can kind of conduct an invisible orchestra, that's a classic. Like every <laughs> every music tech un every music tech undergrad thinks of that at some point and goes, oh man, I need to build that. That's great. And people have been doing that for a long time. I right. wasn't aware of this when I was an undergrad, but yeah, it is a classic and, right, right. and a lot of work like that has already been done <laughs> like 20 years ago. Right, um, right, right. And people build some crazy, crazy devices, just like building themselves like robot arms 
with MIDI controllers and, and there's some crazy performances out there. Mm. Um, but yeah, in my case, I embarked on the same journey and I said, okay, what do I need? I need a, um, a 3D motion sensor in the, on the wrist and then I'll take that as input data and I'll try to get that data as fast as possible into my computer and then see how I can map it to sounds in a way that creates interesting combinations of gestures and sounds. And I was very interested in the gestures specifically. So I wanted to, the underlying idea behind it was that there's like a certain aesthetic and a certain information encoded in the gestures that I make. And I wanted to have that certain uh, information reflected in the sound design, which means like all my hand movements were very wavy and the sound design was very wavy. That was, <laughs> that was kind of the result of that. Um, and under the hood, it's like basically like an accelerometer slash gyroscope, which is uh, is a motion sensor that you have in most pieces of electronic nowadays. Um, one good thing about it is that it can detect when it's falling, mm -hmm. um, which means it was used. I mean, it's even if it's not used for anything else at all, it's used to shut down the hard drives when your laptop is in free fall. It's probably not so important nowadays anymore because of SSDs, but back in the days, that was like the main application of that. Oh, uh, but you can get those little things and they're quite cheap and small. And then I hooked that up to the smallest Arduino I could find. And then I hooked that up to a little Bluetooth sender um, that would get that into my laptop. Um, and then I spent a couple of months, I had lots of time back then uh, to, package that data in a way that makes make the latency really short so that you make a movement and immediately get you get feedback. That was an important part of it. Um, and then it was just a lot of custom made sound mappings. So like trying to um, you get you get like rotational data and you get um, um, orientation. So changes in orientation and changes in rotation is kind of the information that you get. And then taking that data and mangling it into something that's usable for sound mappings was the other big challenge in that, pro in that project. So um, did you choose the sound waves to use if the, if the uh, orientation was a specific, uh, at a specific point or no? Yeah, exactly. I'll, I'll give you an example. So one mapping would be, um, I have a, I call them impacts. So when I would take my hand and I would, uh, flick with my finger, that would be like a small, short, um, shaking of the sensor. And that's something that I could pick up. And that's something that I could differentiate from just moving my hand in general because they, the movements there are much larger and slower. So I could sep separate flicking from larger hand movements. Um, and then I would say, okay, every time I flick, it's just like this footsteps and Y's. Every time you flick, you take a short impact sound from this bucket. Um, and then I would say, okay, but if I flick while I'm doing another movement, I can take the like the intensity of that movement and use that as additional information for the flicking. So if I flick a little bit here, then that would, um, uh, I applied it for to um, like percussive sounds, for example. And then this would be a low velocity percussive sound. And then if I would make a big gesture with it and then flick, then there would be a lot more energy in that. So it would choose from a higher energy percussion sound. Um, and then that would basically give me the possibility to play velocity, um, play impact sounds at different mm -hmm. velocities. Um, but then you could also differentiate, well, okay, I have the orientation of my hand, so maybe this is a different sound than if I have my hand like this and I flick like this. And then I can combine that with uh, the flicking and the movement. So, and like this, you would kind of build more and more well, basically access to, to more and more sounds. Hmm. Um, and then th there would still be like a lot of sounds that you can't really control really well. 
um, things that are not intuitive to to control in this way, but other things would be very intuitive. And then I would just say, well, I don't need pitch control, for example, because uh, I mean, there's a bunch of glo um, like glove projects out there, which, for example, use control like this. And I just felt like that that gesture wasn't particularly meaningful. Um, you might as well use a pitch bend on a on a keyboard. So I didn't use that, which meant I couldn't control pitch. So then that would have implications for the kind of sounds that I use. And then I said, okay, well, I only use sounds where I don't want to control pitch. So mm -hmm. percussive sounds with processing or like um, drone sounds, which kind of have their own pitch movement built in. Um, but I'm not interested in controlling that. Um, so kind of like the, the things that you are capable of controlling in real time through your sensor input uh, have implications for the sound language that you use. So if there's no good way to control pitch, you could choose a sound language where pitch is not necessary to be controlled. Right, right, right. That's, uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's cool. what was going on there. And it was, I mean, it was a really fun project. I, I, this kind of digital musical instrument design, that's kind of the, the, the process that mm -hmm. it's called. And for me, it was always a really fun process, really interesting. Yeah. Like it's a difficult challenge to build, to build good musical instruments. And you're competing with like centuries of, of incredibly talented instrument makers on the acoustical instrument side. So it's, it's really harsh <laughs> and I haven't found much which is really comparable to acoustical instruments, but it's a great challenge. And it's really, I really like this combination of, uh, of like technical challenges, like how do you mangle the data correctly? So it's useful and creative challenges. What language, what sound set do you use with that? Mm -hmm. um, and kind of interaction design, how do you create uh, like an interactivity that is fun and feels meaningful and and feels like it's worth doing yeah it's a it's a really nice activity hard to get paid for but it's fun <laughs> yeah yeah no definitely but so how, how do you approach challenges like that where you trying to do something you've never done before yeah how, how do you approach that and how do you break it down to smaller problems so you then can start solving them and and in the end and create something um i And I mean, there's nowadays, I wish I had a more thorough technical background because I just noticed that the more I can code, um, the easier everything becomes and the more creative I can be. Okay. So I really miss the fact that I, I mean, when I was in my undergrad, I wasn't particularly interested in coding and I only did what was necessary to do the projects that I had in mind. So I would look at a project and be like, okay, uh, now I need to find a good way to represent like sensor data as a as an eight bit value that I can quickly send via Bluetooth into a computer. And then I just Google uh, quick ways to send data via Bluetooth and be like, oh shit, what's this? This is uh, horribly complicated. <laughs> yeah. And then just like bash my head through it until I would find some sort of solution. Um, and then I would stop it. Like, I don't care about Bluetooth anymore. I have my data and I'm not willing to learn anything else about this because I'm now, I now want to do something else. Uh, but nowadays I, I'm a bit more thorough <laughs> in my approach. So for, uh, for the unity project, for example, I spent just a couple of months, um, doing tutorials like one hour a day without having a cl clear idea of what it would be useful for me afterwards. Mm -hmm. So I, I learned like some fundamental programming for, for game design, which is not what I wanted to do. Uh, but I still did it because without, even if, even though I didn't know what I would need these individual pieces of knowledge for, once I did the tutorials and I had that basic knowledge, it was much easier for me to come up with approaches to solve these different things um 
So, and I did this uh, similar thing with Wise now. Uh, I spend a bunch of time looking into um, how do you optimize audio CPU usage on mobile um, mm. platforms. That was the last thing that I, I learned on my tutorials, uh, on my uh, on my learning quests. And I don't know if it's particularly useful, but I'm just a little bit more thorough now because having that little bit of extra knowledge can very easily make it, um, like give you a quick solution further down the line. So having just a, a bit broader skill set mm. in these individual areas is just going to be helpful um, instead of like, only learning for the problems that you have right now and only like finding only looking for skills uh for the projects for the problems that you face right now and that you type into google to solve just those right that makes sense and i i actually done the same like you like you said like starting my ios programming journey i was like that too it's like i don't know what I don't really care. I just want to solve this problem. Then fuck it. Mm. <laughs> yeah, I don't want. I don't want to deal with that piece of thing anymore. But I'm also slow, like slowly realizing I need to uh, uh, take it a bit easier and actually trying to understand really what's going on. Uh, yeah, like, like you, like you said, I think that's valuable. But how how do you um, like how do you solidify your learning so it really sticks? Do you repeat stuff or what's your process? Uh, that's a <laughs> that's a tough one. Um, I I don't really. I mean, the things that I've done three years ago are just not as present as things that I do right now. So the pipeline that I have for that right now is I learn as much as I can until I have some sort of test. So things need to be as at least good enough for that test, and I find some exam somewhere. Maybe it's a certification or it's like a practice exam or something. So that's kind of the first milestone. Um, and then I try to find a project that I can use that in mm. to, to not only be able to solve problems that you would usually have if you use that. Like I don't do any game design, but I want to learn Unity. So all those problems are very foreign to me and I don't encounter them in my everyday work. So as a next step, I try to find a project that needs exactly those skills um, so that I can use that knowledge to encounter, like to solve problems that I have for my own work. And the, I mean, for me, the nice thing about my, my PhD is that I have the flexibility to make that work. So if I say I would like to um, have a project that involves wise uh, that involves the common game audio workflows as well as virtual reality applications, then I can try to try to find one. <laughs> this is like, okay, well, uh, the pandemic is here, so I need a virtual robot. I'll do some 3D modeling. I'll put people in a headset because I need to collect data uh, and survey their experience. So I can put that kind of together and then say, okay, this is going to take me a couple of months. This is now part of my PhD and I can use these and these skills in that. Mm -hmm. And that's been that's been really helpful because I now I kind of I always try to uh, like design my projects in a way that it requires me to that I have like some new skills that I want to try out and test out and solidify, uh, which I can then put into these projects. And um, yeah, that's that's worked pretty well for me. But we'll see in three years. Maybe, <laughs> maybe I forget again. Yeah, no, but that <clears throat> that makes sense, man. Uh, but yeah, it's been it's been a real pleasure talking to you, Frederick. And I think what you do, like I look through your website, your your music also. I should not forget to mention that. But that's also killer. Uh, like I saw some clip on Instagram. It was like a time signature. It was like three fourteen over whatever it was. Do you know what I'm talking about? Um, I know that I that I lied about that. It's oh, just okay. four four. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't even know even know how you count three point fourteen, whatever it was. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but your music is is really good, man. Uh, Thanks, man. 
And I encourage people to check it out. Do you have any new music in the works? Or what's that EP you released? Was it this year? Yeah, that was recently. That was like a month ago. Um, mm. That was uh, a new EP after a while, which was which was great because I, I was um, itching to put some new music out there. And this project was very good for me to kind of get a deadline, get a project and make that work. Um, get external deadlines for submitting the masters because um, that kind of forced me to put everything together mm. um, and the main the great thing that came out of that for me was that I just got in touch with a lot of uh, musicians that I had been um, admiring until now so that was uh, that was a great experience that came out of that because it just allowed me to connect with a bunch of uh, musicians that work in a similar genre at the moment and it was really nice to kind of like put yourself out there and then some some people actually said oh this is quite nice I like this and I thought well I <laughs> you do that way better I'm, I'm I'm very flattered um what do you even like about it um and so now one of those one of the results of that EP was that I'm now co-producing a an LP from another musician at the moment so that's going to be uh my next creative outlet nice it's coming up. yeah it's it's awesome to combine technology with music because it just goes hands hand it goes hand in hand uh, so well like that's that's one of the reasons I I love coding also because it feels you know, very similar to making music. Like you, you think about stuff, and then you can create that thing and then release it. It's the same sort of pleasure, right? Mm. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's, it's true. I mean, I was for a long time. I thought to myself that it's incredibly important to me to be creative in my work, mm. and that's why, like, getting a degree in music, which is usually a like a horrible idea was the only way for me because I just needed creativity in my work. Um, and now I realize that there's creativity in so many different types of work out there. And, and it's not necessary to, uh, to study music to get that because I, I just see people around me who work in completely different fields and their work is very creative, like creative problem solving, um, uh, just creative projects there's there's so many ways to be creative and now i'm trying to catch up on the, on the technical side because yeah, it's, yeah. <laughs> it's, there's many ways to make that happen and and for me the most interesting way is to do it at like have some musical element but have a technical element as well mm, definitely uh but yeah frederick it's been a pleasure uh really interesting same here thanks so much for talking to me it was a pleasure, man. And I'm going to get into WISE and Unity, see what I can learn. <laughs> Go for it. Like I can it. only recommend it. It's a, it's a fun process. Awesome, man. Thank you, Frederick, for coming on. It was super cool talking to you, and I really enjoyed it. And I hope you, the listener or watcher, enjoyed it as well. Again, check out uh, the clips we're talking about in the description below. Check out Frederick's uh, website. His other work is really, really cool. Um, and let me know if you're going to get into Unity after having watched this conversation or start learning programming and to make your own musical interfaces or own instruments. Uh, please let me know in the comments. I'd love to hear uh, if you got inspired to try this yourself. Uh, and also, please subscribe to the YouTube channel uh, or Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you are listening or watching this show. Your support really matters and we're growing slowly but steadily and that's all thanks to you so I really appreciate your support again if you want exclusive access to interviews before the public please check out the audit tribe email list there's a link to that in the description below to send your name and email address and you have joined the audit tribe email list but that's it for this week awesome to have you here awesome to have frederick here uh, i will see you next week again so take care and see you soon